Uh, would they it be are. okay if they raised their hands? Is that all right? Well, if they're okay with it, I'm okay with it. Uh, thank you all. I, I, you have labored hard, and your work product is impressive. And I just want to thank you all for what you've done for the country. And, uh, Ms. Horowitz, I'm dying to hear from you, but <clears throat> I bet I haven't made 20 minutes of opening statements in a year. But I'm going to take a little bit longer uh, to try to lay out what I think is before us as a nation. Uh, Crossfire Hurricane was probably the best name ever given to an investigation in the history of investigations, because I think that's what we wound up with, a crossfire and a hurricane. Uh, there's been a lot of media reports about your report before it was issued. And I remember reading all these headlines, uh, lawful investigation with a few irregularities. Everything <clears throat> okay, low-level people kind of got off track. If that's what you get out of this report, you clearly didn't read it. If that's your takeaway, that this thing was lawfully predicated, and that's the main point, you missed the entire report. How do you get a headline like that? That's what you want it to be. You want it to be that and nothing more. And I can assure you, if this had been a Democratic president going through what President Trump had gone through, that would not have been the headline. The headline would be, the FBI takes law into its own hands. Biased agents cut corners, lie to court, ignore exoneration. So the first thing I want you to know is how the cake is baked here. And my goal is to make sure that people, when this is over, whether you like Trump, hate Trump, don't care about Trump, you look at this as more than a few irregularities. Because if this becomes a few irregularities in America, then God help us all. Now, the people that were in charge in this investigation were handpicked by Mr. McCabe who is now CNN analyst, high up in the FBI, the number two guy. The first question I will ask in a bit, is this the best of the best? Are these people normal representatives of the Department of Justice and the FBI? I hope you will say no, because I believe it to be no. And if I believed otherwise, I would be incredibly depressed. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to assume something for the sake of argument. That there was a lawful predicate to open up a counterintelligence investigation. And I want you to know the standard to open one up is about like that. And I also want you to know a counterintelligence investigation is not a criminal investigation. They're not trying to solve a crime they're trying to stop foreign powers from interfering in America. That a counterintelligence investigation is designed to protect Americans from foreign influence. I want the American people to know there was an effort to affect Hillary Clinton's campaign by foreign actors. The FBI picked up that effort. They briefed her about it and they were able to stop it. We will be receiving a defensive briefing tomorrow as a committee from the FBI to tell us all about what we should be watching for. And they may be some specific threats against us. I don't know. But I know they're going to brief us to protect us, not to surveil us. And here's what I want every American to know. From the time they opened up Crossfire Hurricane, so this debacle was over. They never made any effort to brief Donald Trump about suspected problems within his campaign. They had one briefing talking about, you know, the Russians are out there, you, netter, you, you better beware. Nothing about Carter Page, nothing about Papadopoulos, nothing about the other people that they thought might be working with the Russians. Why did they not tell him that? 
I hope you can give us an answer. Bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, a counterintelligence investigation is a good thing until it becomes a bad thing. Because it doesn't take much to open one. And the worst thing can happen is for people to open one up whose real purpose is not to protect an American, but to surveil them. Senator Feinstein found herself in a situation all of us may one day find ourselves in. A longtime employee was suspected of having ties to a foreign government. They informed her and she took appropriate action. How easy would it be for somebody to come in our campaigns as a volunteer? We really don't know who they are. You just appreciate any help you can get. How easy would it be for all of us to get caught up in this scenario? I hope all of us would appreciate, if you really believe there's somebody in my campaign working with a foreign power, please tell me so I can do something about it. Why didn't they tell Trump? We'll figure that out later. But I think it's a question that needs to be asked. <coughs> so for a moment, let's assume that there was a lawful predicate to open up a counterintelligence investigation. What has been described as a few irregularities becomes a massive criminal conspiracy over time to defraud the FISA court, to illegally surveil an American citizen, and to keep an operation open against a sitting president of the United States, violating every norm known to the rule of law. Many of you are prosecutors. Many of you have been U.S. attorneys. Many of you have been defense attorneys. Trump's time will come and go. But I hope we understand that what happened here can never happen again. Because what happened here is not a few irregularities. What happened here is the system failed. People at the highest level of our government took the law in their own hands. And when I say defraud the FISA court, I mean it. To your team, you are able to uncover and discover abuse of power I never believed would actually exist in 2019. How bad is it? Is as, it was, is, was as if J. Edgar Hoover came back to life. The old FBI, the FBI that had a chip on its shoulder and wanted to intimidate people and find out what was going on in your life and the law be damned. Martin Luther King and you just fill in the names. So, who ran this thing? The people were handpicked by McCabe, the number two guy at the FBI. The supervisory agent, the deputy assistant director for counterintelligence, is Peter Strzok. He's a big player in all things Crossfire Hurricane. Lisa Page, you may have heard of her. Who was she? She was an FBI lawyer working for McCabe. These are two central characters in this debacle. Let me tell you a little bit about who these people are and where they're coming from. Thanks to a lot of hard work by people for Mr. Horowitz, the FBI, and others, here's what we know. Struck, the frontline supervisor, February the 12th, 2016. Oh, he's, Trump, abysmal. I keep hoping the charade will end and people will just dump him. The problem then is that Rubio will likely lose to Cruz. I never quite made it, and I can understand why they would not consider me a serious candidate. <laughs> the Republican Party is utter shambles. When was the last competitive ticket they offered? March 3rd, 2016. Page, God, Trump is a loathsome human. Struck, oh my God, he's an idiot. And you know what? Newsrooms all over the country, people are nodding. This represents the attitude of a lot of people in America, and you can have that attitude, but you shouldn't be in the journalism business. 
You shouldn't be at the FBI. If you were in the military and you said anything like this about a commander in chief, you'd be charged with a crime. Remember the McChrystal debacle where they had a barroom discussion with a reporter from the Rolling Stone? What's the takeaway? Don't go to a bar with a Rolling Stone reporter. They started talking about how they didn't like Joe Biden. And I was one of the first people to say that is out of bounds. You can have all the political opinions you want, but if you're an officer in the United States military, you will park those opinions and you will not speak ill of the commander in chief. But that obviously is not a rule at the FBI Department of Justice. March 16, 2016. I cannot believe Donald Trump is likely to be actual serious candidate for president. July 16th, we're getting closer to when this thing opens. And wow, Donald Trump is an enormous douche. Again, a lot of people agree with that. Trump barely spoke, but the first thing out of his mouth was, we're going to win so big. The whole thing is like living in a bad dream. July the 19th, 2016. Trump is a disaster. I have no idea how destabilizing his presidency would be. And a lot of people believe that. You're entitled to believe that, but you should not be an investigator. July the 30th, the investigation's open. And damn, this feels momentous about the investigation because this matters. The others one did too, but that was to ensure we didn't F something up. This matters because this matters. So super glad to be on this voyage with you. I hope you understand what this voyage was about. August 8, 2016. Three days before Strzok was named the frontline supervisor. He's not ever going to become president, right? Page to Strzok. Strzok, no. No, he won't. We'll stop it. These are the people in charge. August 15, 2016. I want to believe the path you threw out for consideration in Andy's office, that there's no way he gets elected. But I'm afraid we can't take that risk that the American people will pick their president is what they're saying. It's like an insurance policy in the unlike, unlike, unlikely event you die before you're 40. August 26, 2016. Just went to Southern, just went to a Southern Virginia Walmart. I could smell the Trump support. People in charge. October 11, 2016, currently fighting with Stu for the FISA. Stu was a lawyer who thought this thing was not on the up and up. Stood his ground until he couldn't stand it anymore. Eventually got run over. October the 19th, I'm all riled up. Trump is an effing idiot, is unable to provide a coherent answer. The New York Times probability numbers are dropping every day. I'm scared for our organization, November the 3rd, 2016. Oh my God, this is effing terrifying. Referencing an article entitled, A Victory by Trump Remains Possible. November the 9th, 2016. Are you ever going to give out your calendars? Some kind of depressing. Maybe it should be the first meeting of the secret society. November the 13th, I, brought all the, I bought all the president's men. I figure I needed to brush up on Watergate. November the 13th, 2016. Finally, two, way, two pages away from finishing all the president's men. Page to Strzok. Did you know the president resigns at the end? Strzok, what? God, that would be so lucky. May 18th, 2017, the date Page accepted a position on the special counsel's team. For me, in this case, I personally have a sense of unfinished business. I unleashed with MYE, whatever that means. Now I need to fix it and finish it. Struck. Who gives a F? one more assistant director or whoever, an investigation leading to impeachment. May 2017. 
You and I both know the odds are nothing. If I thought it was likely, I'd be there. I'd be there. I'd, I'd be there, no question. I hesitate in part just because of my gut sense and concern there's no big there there. <laughs> Talking about impeachment. May 22nd, 2017. I'm torn. I think, no, I'm more replaceable than you are in this. I'm the best for it, but there are others who can do it okay. You're different and more unique. This is yours. Talking to Paige. All right. That's the frontline supervisor and the lawyer to McCabe. There's a guy named Kleinsmith who eventually alters an email from the CIA to the Department of Justice and FBI. And Mr. Horowitz's team found this out and how they did it, I will never know. I'm jumping ahead here. But when you read this report, what they find is that a lawyer supervising the FISA process at the FBI, according to Mr. Horowitz, doctored an email from the CIA to the FBI, and he's going to be referred for criminal prosecution. Why is that important? Carter Page, who's been on the receiving end of all this, the foundation to believe he was a foreign agent comes from a dossier that we'll talk about in a minute. In that dossier provided by Christopher Steele, and we'll talk about him in a minute, they claim that Carter Page meets with three people known to be Russians, Russian agents, people associated with Russia. Carter Page, while being wiretapped by his government, says, I don't know two of these people. And to this day, there is no proof that he ever met two of those three. The third person, he says, yeah, I met him. I told the CIA about my meeting because I was a source for the CIA. So they would have you believe that Carter Page is working against our government not with our government. So Carter Page in the summer of 2017 is tr trying to tell anybody and everybody, I was working with the CIA, I reported my contact with this person, and nobody believed him. The CIA had told the FBI it was true earlier, but it never made it through the system. Somebody got so rattled at the FBI, they asked Mr. Kleinsmith to check it out. He checks it out. He communicates with the CIA. Is Carter Page a source for you? In an email exchange, they say, yes, he is. What does Mr. Kleinsmith do? He alters the email to say, no, he's not. And you caught him. I don't know how you caught him because you got to dig into this email chain. It would be like getting a lab report from the FBI. The fingerprints don't match, and the agent says they do. That's how bad this is. So now let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Kleinsmith, if I can find it. Can you get me the Kleinsmith stuff? All right, this is the lawyer <laughs> supervising the FISA warrant process, the guy that altered this CIA email because he didn't want the court to know that Carter Page actually was a source. And why does that matter? Because if the court had known, then there's a lawful reason for Mr. Page to be talking to the Russian guy. He wasn't working against his country. He was working with his country, which undercuts the idea he's a foreign agent. That's why Klein Smith lied because he didn't want to stop this investigation. All right, this is after the election. I am so stressed about what I could have done differently the day after the election. I'm just devastated. I can't wait until I can leave today and just shut off the world for the next four days. I'm sure a lot of people felt that way after Trump got elected, maybe still feel that way, but you shouldn't be in charge of supervising 
anything about Donald Trump if you feel that way. I just can't imagine the systematic disassembly of the progress we've made over the last eight years. The Obama administration. The crazies won finally. This is the lawyer that they put in, in charge of supervising the warrant process. This is the Tea Party on steroids. And I'm sure there are newsrooms all over America saying that's absolutely right. What is wrong with that? Oh, also, Pence is stupid. Whatever. This is what the guy's saying right after the election. And it's just hard not to feel like the FBI caused some of this. It was a razor thin in some states. Plus, my goddamn name is all over the legal documents investigating Trump's staff. And this is the one that gets me the most. November the 22nd, shortly after the election of Donald J. Trump, the FBI lawyer in charge of supervising the FISA process tweets out to friends, Viva la resistance. What are the odds that this guy might do something wrong? Would you have to be part of a right wing, right wing conspiracy to predict in the future maybe this guy will get off script? Folks, if these are a few irregularities, the rule of law in this country is dead. And here's the good news. Good news. These are not a few irregularities. These are a few bad people that couldn't believe Trump won, didn't want him to believe, didn't want him to win, and when he won, couldn't tolerate the fact that he won. And all these smelly people elected him. This is bad stuff. So if you get out of this report, lawful investigation with a few irregularities, it says more about you than Mr. Horowitz. Now, how the hell did this whole thing start? What got us here today? They opened up a counterintelligence investigation in July. We know the Russians are messing in our election. And it was the Russians, ladies and gentlemen, who stole the Democratic National Committee emails, Podesta's emails, and screwed around with Hillary Clinton. It wasn't the Ukrainians. It was the Russians. And they're coming after us again. So to be concerned that the Russians are messing with presidential campaigns was a legitimate concern. So they looked around at the Trump campaign and said, well, let's see if we can protect the Trump campaign. Carter Page went to Moscow a lot, made speeches. If you've ever met Carter Page, one thing you will not accuse him of is being James Bond. This poor guy, Papadopoulos, picked by Sam Clovis to be part of Trump's national security team. This national security team was literally picked up off the street. If you've had a photo with Donald Trump, you spent more time with Donald Trump than Papadopoulos and Page. <coughs> they're not paid, they're volunteers. But the FBI thinks we need to watch these guys with Manaport, uh, as well as, who's the other one? Flynn, General Flynn. So they open up a counterintelligence investigation. Let's assume for a moment that the small predicate you need has been met. What the hell happened after they opened it up? What did they find? Were their suspicions validated? Or did they find at every turn it's really not true and they ignored it? So one of the first things they tried to do was to get a warrant under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to follow Carter Page, a volunteer for the campaign, an American citizen. They applied for the warrant internally in August of 2016, and the lawyers say, you don't have enough. Why? Because they had nothing. Maybe this reasonable articulation is this small, but to get a warrant from a court, you've got to have probable cause. So the lawyer's saying, you don't have it. Everybody is now frustrated, folks, 
that's not the right answer. So McCabe suggests, the number two guy at the FBI, well, let's go look at this Steele dossier. Maybe that will get us over the hump. Just stay tuned. We'll talk about that in a minute. So on September the 19th, for the first time, they introduced the Steele dossier into the warrant application process. It worked. September the 21st, they get a sign off, let's go get a warrant. The dossier got them to where they wanted to go. As you say, Mr. Horowitz, it was central and basically outcome determinative. Without this dossier, they go nowhere. With it, they're off to the races. Who is Christopher Steele? You thought these other people were bad? <laughs> Wait till you hear about this guy. Christopher Steele was a former uh, MI6, is that right? Six, five, whatever it is. He was a British agent. Retired. He had a new line of business. He was hired by a company <coughs> called Fusion GPS to investigate Donald Trump. Okay, you want to look at foreign influence, you're about to find it. Fusion GPS is on the payroll of the Democratic National Party. Christopher Steele is working for a company to find dirt on Trump, and the money comes from the Democratic Party. Did they tell the court this? No. Is that a bit unnerving? Would be to me. So Christopher Steele is on the payroll of a company funded by the Democratic Party. Here's what Bruce Orr tells the FBI, FBI about Christopher Steele. He was desperate that Donald Trump not get elected and was passionate about him not being the U.S. president. This is the guy that gave them the work product to get the warrant. Steele told Orr that if Trump won the elections, Steele's source network may be in jeopardy by a new FBI director and new agency heads appointed by Trump who would have a higher degree of loyalty to the new president and could decide to take action against Steele and his source network. Let me tell you about Christopher Steele. Orr was right. He was on a mission to get Donald Trump. Not only did he provide the dossier that made the difference in getting a warrant, his biases were well known he was shopping the dossier, do we have it? To anybody and everybody in the media and in politics to see if they would print it. The reason the FBI cut him loose was because they found out he was shopping this thing around to media outlets rather than being a valid source. But after they knew he was shopping around. They kept him around anyway because Mr. Orr kept talking to him. And you think that's it. Bruce Orr's wife worked with Christopher Steele. She was employed by Fusion GPS, the wife of the number four guy at the FBI. Christopher Steele went all over the United States trying to get media outlets to publish this garbage. The first thing is about the golden shower, about the sexual encounter that President Trump supposedly had in a Ritz-Carlton hotel in Russia. Let me tell you how I come to find out about Christopher Steele's work product. In December of 2016, John McCain goes to a national security conference uh, in Canada, and somebody tells him about the Steele dossier, and it's bad and you need to know about it, and it gets to John McCain. John McCain puts it in his safe. He gives it to me, and I read it. And the first thing I thought of was, oh, my God. One of two things. This could be Russian disinformation, or they may have something on Trump. If you read this document, the first thing you would think of is they got something on Donald Trump. It is stunning, it is damning, it is salacious, and it's a bunch of crap. 
they finally find the guy that prepared all the information. But a little bit about Steele. In 2015, the British Intelligence Service said, you need to watch this guy, he's not reliable. They take time to go to London to check Steele out. And they're told he demonstrates lack of self-awareness, poor judgment, keen to help but underpinned by poor judgment, judgment pursuing people with political risk but no intel value. If you had spent 30 minutes looking at Christopher Steele, you would understand this guy is biased, he's got an ax to grind, he's on the payroll of the opposing party, take anything he says with a grain of salt. In January 2017, the FBI figures out who the subsource of the Steele dossier is. What you need to know, this is not what Steele found himself. This is what he gathered from one person. They finally found out who this one person is. They go talk to him in January 2017. Where's that summary? Five people interview the primary subsource, the guy that provided Steele with everything. And they showed him the dossier. Read pages 186 to 190. What does the Russian guy tell the FBI about the, FBI about the dossier? That Steele misstated or exaggerated the prime subsource's statements? That Trump's alleged sexual activities at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Moscow was rumor and speculation? He went on to say he heard it at a bar. And in the report, it suggests that a Western employee of the Ritz-Carlton confirmed this escapade by then uh, private citizen Trump. When he read that, he says, that's not true. I never told Steele that somebody working for the Ritz-Carlton confirmed this. I heard it at a bar. Primary subsource stated, did he never expect it still to put the primary subsource's statements in reports or present them as facts? They were word of mouth and hearsay. Conversations had with friends over beers were statements made in jest that should be taken with a grain of salt. So in January 2017, the person who did all the assembling of the information for the now famous Steele uh, steel dossier tells the FBI, I disavow everything in there. Now, what should happen? Time out. Let's reassess. Maybe we got this wrong. What would you hope to happen? That the FBI would slow down? because this is the outcome determinative document that's just had a hole blown through it. They don't slow down. They use the document they now know to be a bunch of garbage twice more to get a warning against Carter Page. I hope Carter Page gets a lawyer and sues the hell out of the Department of Justice and the FBI. Two more warrants were obtained by the Department of Justice and the FBI after being told in January by the Russian guys, all a bunch of bull. But it gets worse. Here's how they describe the interview to the court. The FBI found that the Russian-based subsource to be truthful and cooperative. Nothing about, and oh, by the way, he said everything in there is a bunch of bull. You knew in January 2017, if there was no doubt before, you know by the guy who prepared it that he disavowed everything. It's not true. It's a grain of salt. You shouldn't. I didn't say all these things. Instead of stopping, they keep going. And instead of telling the court the, court the truth, what they're required to do, they lie to the court. A few irregularities. How would you like this to happen in your life? How would you like to be on the receiving end of this? To our people in the, the news business, what would you like? How would you like this to be your news organization?
In January 2017, there is no benefit of the doubt to be given. These five people from the Department of Justice and the FBI have been told by the one guy who did all the work as a bunch of garbage. And the question is, how far up to the system did it go? Why did they apply for a warrant twice more? Why didn't they stop? Everybody wants to know, was there any bias here? What motivated these people? Why do you think they kept going? Maybe because they were on a mission not to protect Trump, but to protect us from Trump. That's what they were trying to protect all of us smelly people from Donald Trump. That's what this is about. Whether you believe it or not, I believe it. And you know what? It could happen to you all next time. There's some pretty passionate people on our side that I wouldn't want to be investigating any of you. So what happens next? They get a warrant twice more when they know it's a bunch of garbage. They lie to the court about the actual interview. I don't know what McCabe and Comey knew, but I'm dying to find out, and should they have known. June 2016, 2017. This is the next time they take the law in their own hands. Mr. Kleinsmith, six months after being told the dossier is a bunch of garbage, Kleinsmith alters an email from the CIA to change it from he is to he's not. Because if they had told the court that Page was working for the CIA, it explains the contact in the dossier. Mr. Kleinsmith had a chance in his mind to make things right, and he took it. Why did he take the law in his own hands? Why did he doctor the email? Did it have anything to do with the way he sees Donald Trump's presidency? You know what? It really doesn't matter what he was thinking. It matters what he did. And I'm glad you found out what he did. I'm glad you told the country what he did, because I'm hoping that nobody will ever do it again. So, Mr. Horowitz, the 17 irregularities that you found, some of them are earth-shattering. Some of them should scare the hell, out, hell of, out, the hell out of all of us. I just want to end sort of where I began. This is not normal. Don't judge the FBI and the Department of Justice by these characters. We're better than this. Like many of you, I've worked with the FBI a lot of my time in government. I have a great respect for it. Director Ray, you got a problem. And for this hearing to mean anything, we got to fix it. And the way we fix it is listen to Mr. Horowitz and get the director of the FBI in here to try to find out a way to make sure this never happens again to any politician in this country. It's Trump today, it could be you or me tomorrow. And imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if they can do this to the candidate for the president of the United States, what could they do to you? So the Trump presidency will end in a year or five years. I don't know when. I hope he gets reelected. But we can't write this off as being just about one man or one event. We've got to understand how off the rails the system got. And I'll leave uh, with some optimism here. I think Democrats and Republicans are willing to make sure this never happens again. That if you open up a counterintelligence investigation on a presidential campaign in the future, there needs to be more checks and balances. I want you to audit the FISA process. Mike Lee and Senator Leahy are probably the standard bearers for civil liberties. Cruz, a lot of people, we all care. But these are the two that constantly want to make sure that somebody's watching those who watch us. They're worried about metadata. While I may not agree with all of your concerns or all of your solutions, I 
respect the fact that you care. I hope you won't treat this report as finding a lawful investigation with a few irregularities. I'm a pretty hawkish guy. But if the court doesn't take corrective action and do something about being manipulated and lied to, you will lose my support. I know a lot about what's going on out there to hurt us. And they're real threats. And they're real agents. And they're really bad actors out there. I'd hate to lose the ability of the FISA court to operate at a time probably when we need it the most. But after your report, I have serious concerns about whether the FISA court can continue unless there's fundamental reform. After your report, I think we need to rewrite the rules of how you start a counterintelligence investigation and the checks and balances that we need. Mr. Horowitz, for us to do justice to your report, we have to do more than try to shade this report one way or the other. We have to address the underlying problem of a system in the hands of a few bad people can do a lot of damage. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I assume there is no time limit. Take all the time you need. Well, I, I won't take a long time, but um, I've been reading these reports, ladies and gentlemen, now for 25 years. And I have great appreciation for this Inspector General. And I just want to make those personal remarks. Uh, this is a tough arena. And as you can see, there are very tough people part of that arena. But to have an inspector general who tells it as they see it and does this year after year is a saving grace. And I hope people will get this report. If I have a grievance, it's that the print is too small. I agree with that. And thank you very much. And it is heavy to carry around. But 